This is the Art and Business of Writing Podcast. Janae Sasso has an extensive financial background and has served others as a financial professional through a variety of uh, capacities over her 15 plus year career. She has earned her real estate broker's license, Series 6 and 63 securities, and life producer's licenses all before the age of 24. She has a bachelor's degree in accounting and an MBA from Liberty University. She's been married to her husband, Donald Sasso, for 14 years and is a homeschool mom of their two children. Welcome to the show, Janae. Thanks for having me, Chris. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have you on. You know, you'll be the first person I've ever had to really um, kind of outline the financial plan of business, so I'm really excited to have you. Yeah, that's so, a, business is an exciting topic. Oh, Love yes, it. it is. It is. So take us a little bit beyond the bio and tell us a little more about yourself. Well, I have uh, had to leave college at an, uh, in my second year. Um, due to my caregiving responsibilities, caring for my grandma. And so with that, I had to find an alternate uh, career path. And so uh, entrepreneurship was that alternative because it gave me the flexibility uh, to be able to, you know, do what I needed to do at home uh, as far as caring for my loved ones. But it also gave me the freedom to pursue my goals and to do that without necessarily having a physical degree. You know, um, most of the time when you start out in life, you are working for that degree to kind of validate you and hopefully, you you know, maybe give you some uh, good insight on what steps to take once you leave that institution. Well, I didn't have that. And so uh, entrepreneurship was a way for me to just kind of hit the ground running and just trial and error. (laughs) Oh, I hear that. Um, That's the beauty of entrepreneurship. It's one of those things where, you know, it's challenging, but it's forgiving because you can make the mistakes. You can learn the lessons along the way and you can fine tune as you go. That's right. That's right. All right. So let's talk about the financial world as it pertains to setting up a business. A lot of writers who want to get started with developing their businesses either want to use it to manage their books or they want to do it because they want to contribute to publications. Mm-hmm. So I'm ready to take my writing seriously. OK, so what's the first step I need to do to create my business? Well, you need to. I mean, I know it's kind of cliche, but you do need to sit down and do just a a, a quick informal business plan. You know, what are you going to call your business? What is going to be the the focal point of your business? You know, what publications are you going to go after? Are you writing for business columns? Are you writing for lifestyle magazines? I mean, you really need to sit down and give it some thought um, as to what exactly you're shooting for. I know I'm a very goal oriented person, so I have to have that broad picture in front of me to really figure out what it is I'm striving for. So getting that business name, sitting down with a professional to find out what business form you need to take is it going to be you know a sole proprietor is it going to be a s corp is it going to be a c corp is it going to be a llc sitting down with a uh, accounting professional and attorney to figure out what's the best course of action based on the goals that you have in mind okay you know you touched on some good topics and i want to actually get into those first um with regards to my fictitious name, should I use my own name or should I create a name? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just, like I said, I'm just Joe Ryder. It's just me. What do I do? I think it's more of a, a branding decision. You know, are you promote, are you comfortable with just who you are as a person? You know, maybe you have a funny name. I mean, I know we've been watching uh, this big debate about The View with Raven Simone and the name Walla Dramina. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe you maybe you feel like your name might, you know, cause people to close the door. Uh, my mom owned a bookstore and there were certain things that she would encourage writers to do. Maybe it's not such a good idea to, you know, use your name or use even your, uh, you know, uh, sometimes your face on your publication. You know, sometimes um, you, you got to you got to know the industry that you're in and you got to be sensitive that we do live in a world that unfortunately people, you know, try to stereotype you and make decisions about you based on your name, based on how you look. Um, so it might 
be to your advantage to give a pen name. You know, a lot of writers do that. So it's definitely nothing wrong. It just really depends on what you feel comfortable and confident in doing. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned having a plan. How detail oriented should my plan be? Should it just be something that's, you know, very, very specific or should it be like um, general, but I should have a firm idea of what direction I want to go in? Well, a business plan is is a living document. I mean, it's 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 a good ex. It's more of an exercise than it is this foolproof plan that you know is just everything's going to go according to what you write down. So it's more for your own benefit of just making sure that you flesh out your ideas and that you really have an understanding of where you're going and what is going to take place. You know, so for your marketing. You know, that marketing plan is a huge uh, component of your business plan. And if you don't spend enough time figuring out, you know, how you're going to market yourself, you know, are you going to do like Chris? Are you going to do a podcast? You know, are you, uh, you know, going to have featured columns in, in, in a, a, new, a local newspaper? Or are you looking for more of a national presence? Um, you really need to get detailed to force yourself to think things through. And I think sometimes we get so excited about being an entrepreneur and just having that label that we think we just jump in and um, without any kind of thought. And for the most part, you can jump in. No, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't believe in the analysis paralysis where you're analyzing things to where you don't do anything, but you do need to give it some clear thought and writing it down, to, in my opinion, really solidifies that. I mean, I've seen it over and over in my own life is when I write things down, things start to actually happen and I can go back to my notes and I can and look at what I wrote down and actually see how I was able to make decisions that helped me to line up with that goal in mind. Now, structurally, you spoke about the different forms, sole prop, LLC, corporation. For someone just starting out, what do you recommend? Oh, uh, well, I, again, I'm not a attorney, so I won't. Please don't take what I have to say <laughs> to heart. Always consult a, a law professional. But uh, for sole proprietor, that doesn't protect you. You know, if somebody, you know, God forbid, you wrote something or said something that someone felt was defaming, it wouldn't offer you protection. LLC is a very popular format. And so I would always encourage people to look closely at the LLC C corps, you, you want to stay away from, especially if you're a writer. I mean, unless you're starting a firm of some kind, but as a, as a single solopreneur, the LLC is probably uh, the best format uh, for you to you know create your business under. Okay. Now, are there are there advantages? I mean, you spoke about just the liable advantage of not being a sole proprietor, but are there other advantages uh, to each of those? Yeah. Well. I mean, if you're going to be a sole proprietor, that opens you up to a lot of liability. So if someone wanted to put out a suit against you, you don't really have any protection. But if you do an LLC, you do have the protection, but the format is not as complicated, meaning the documents that you have to complete. Like, so for example, if you did an S Corp, which is a, usually a small business corporation, uh, it's a flow through entity. It goes to your tax return. But there you have to actually register with your state of corporation commission in your particular state. And that has fees associated with it. There's a little bit more paperwork involved. And so the LLC kind of gives you the best of both worlds where you're not really having to get so bogged down in paperwork and pay an attorney to help you to complete these things but you can really still have that protection, although you're, you know, you're not a sole proprietor. So it kind of gives you the best of both worlds versus being totally exposed as a sole proprietor or being, you know, bogged down with paperwork and logistics of a corporation. The LLC is kind of in that middle ground. Okay. Now you've used that word no protection multiple times when describing mm -hmm. the, <laughs> when describing <laughs> the, uh, the solo entrepreneur who is just going to go sole prop. In terms of like no protection, does that mean that you said if someone happens to sue me, does that mean that my personal assets are also fair game? Yeah. And that's why a sole proprietorship is, uh, you know, kind of an iffy situation to be with, to be in. I mean, you might start off that way, but I mean, if you're really 
uh, thinking that you're going to be doing this business, not as a hobby, but as a business where you're really trying to make money, the, you know, you're all exposing yourself to risk. I mean, entrepreneurship is risky business. So you want to do the best that you can to protect your own personal assets from that of a, you know, a possible uh, suit that somebody might present in the future. Cause I mean, these days it's very litigious, uh, society and anybody can sue you for anything now it doesn't it we don't even talking about whether they win but the cost of just having to fight uh, a lawsuit alone you know it, that's time consuming and it absorbs your resources so you need to protect yourself you definitely need to protect yourself and an llc will give you more protection than a sole proprietorship would now are there tax benefits yes um the sole proprietorship is just going to go on your schedule c on your on your tax return and you'll get to write off, you know, your business, uh, expenses, all of the entities allow you to do that. But most people are, uh, more focused on the protection aspect of their own assets and the cost of not having to do that additional paperwork, but the tax advantages are the same. You're going to be able to write off, you know, any business expenses that you incur. Okay. Now, with business, of course, comes record keeping. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about taxes, and we're almost in that last quarter, so it's right around the corner. Absolutely. Now, do you have any recommendations for accounting software? I know a lot of businesses, when they first start off, they're using Excel spreadsheets, and they're managing yeah. that, and they're putting receipts in a shoebox. Yep. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. I see it all the time. I what? see it all the time. <laughs> what are your recommendations for record keeping in terms of like software and management? Well, I mean, one, if you're not into doing your own books and you really don't want to get involved in that, then it's best to outsource it and so that you know that it's done right. But I like QuickBooks. I'm a QuickBooks expert, so I, you know, and I'm an accounting professional, so I'm most comfortable with the QuickBooks because of its flexibility and as as it it will grow with you as your business grows so you can add on payroll over time you can add on different modules to help you customize uh the functions within that software and then there's things like fresh books that is out there that's more for the beginner that doesn't really have any accounting background that's good but the flexibility as you grow is not there but it is a little bit simpler to use over QuickBooks because QuickBooks is double entry bookkeeping. It has that capability. And so, but what I like about QuickBooks is that you can invite your accountant on the back end when it's tax time, or if you're, if you're paying someone to do your books, you can have them go into your uh, system uh, remotely and you can send them the file and they can actually make changes and make adjustments and work along with you. And so that's what I really like about QuickBooks and QuickBooks has been around forever and it's just one of the better, I mean, it is one of the best softwares. I don't really have anybody else that I could say, you know, it's, they they have something better than QuickBooks. QuickBooks is is really the is really top notch. And now and they have mobile capability now, so you don't have to be stuck at your desk with the traditional desktop version. You can download QuickBooks to your phone and get your financial statements and all of that stuff. So you know, with the with the in, uh, advent of technology, they've incorporated all of that and taken that all into consideration. Now, what are some of the important functions that I would use in my business that are in QuickBooks? Well, if you're not doing traditional accounting, which is double entry bookkeeping, which probably most people will not do, um, it allows you to basically do debits and credits, you know, write checks, take deposits. And when I started out in business, that was all I did. (laughs) I didn't know (laughs) anything about double entry bookkeeping. I put in the money that I got in from sales and I put in the data that I needed to show that I wrote a check. And then I sent the file to my accountant and let her do what she does, her magic and, and spit out the reports. But I like QuickBooks because it gives you, like I said, you don't have to have that financial expertise, that accounting expertise to use it. And it does allow you to partner with your accountant professional to be able to get it done. But payroll is good. It reminds you about taxes. If you're, you know, at that level of where you're 
um, having to be responsible for payroll taxes, which is a big problem if you're not on time or if you, you know, are not keeping track of your finances so that you have the funds available to pay those taxes. That's a wonderful advantage is that it alerts you to all of that and it will send the payments for you via a check. So there's a lot of functions. And then also your credit card processing, you know, how you take payments. All of that is built into uh, the QuickBooks and that's an important function because, you you know, when you're trying to manage your finances, you try to cut down on the different type of softwares that you have to use. You really don't want to be using a software for this. I mean, it can, it can get very complicated but QuickBooks allows you to consolidate all of that and make it a, a lot of more of a comprehensive function. Now, you brought up taxes, which, mm-hmm. is, which is on the minds of, I'm sure, every business owner as they start off, like, you know, I'm going on this you know, venture to, to start a business. Mm-hmm. How do I plan for taxes? Do I, like, put money away from each sale that I make? Or, like, what do you recommend? Well, first of all, there are some people that, you know, start out in business in their first year, they make a profit and, you know, we applaud them. <laughs> but for most of us, when we start out, it's going to take us a while to, to turn a profit. And so unless you're turning a profit, you will not incur any equity. You only are taxed on your profits. So um, at the end of the fiscal of your fiscal year, whether you're doing a 12 month or maybe you're doing, you know, from June to June, whatever you decide, you and your accounting professional decides it's best for your business. It will be at that time when you'll find out based on the revenue and the profit that you generated, how much tax is going to be due. Most companies are trying to limit our tax liability and we do that with the expenses that we have. So you get to take that into consideration during tax time, is that, and which is most important. And that's where we really need as business owners to keep our focus is to make sure we can account for all those expenses that we say we have. Because if we ever got audited, we would need to be able to prove, you know, like you're driving, you know, are you going to keep track of your gas? Are you going to keep track of your mileage? You know, if you're going to do your mileage, then you need to have a log book and you need to have it written down who you went to see, what was the, you know, purpose behind it? How many miles did you drive? You know, you need to keep a record of that um, so that at tax time when that all that can be taken into consideration. Which brings me to another good question. (laughs) Because with business, I've encountered it. It's happened to me and it's happened to people that I know who've done business where you um, get into the whole thing about what's deductible and what's not deductible. You're like, oh, Mm -hmm. I'm going to lunch today. I'm going to write it off on my taxes. Or I'm going to buy buy a suit. I'm going to write it off on my taxes. And and sometimes we don't understand that these things are really not tax deductible. Mm -hmm. So can you go over like some of the expenses that are tax deductible and some of the stuff that we think is tax deductible, but really isn't? Well, anything that you are doing as a way to promote or initiate a sale of your business, that's going to be tax deductible. So you brought up a good example because especially in a lot of network marketing and home-based business businesses, um, and I was a part of many of them early on in my 20s, And the big thing was always, oh, you can have a vacation and it's a business trip and you write that off. So, you know, uh, or you went out to eat and, you know, you 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 handed out a business card and therefore you can write it off. And you have to be uh, mindful of, you know, are you going to be conservative or are you going to be a little bit more? Uh, liberal in your uh, what you consider to be a business transaction, a, a transaction that is designed to help you to push your business forward. So yes, if you hand out a business card at a dinner um, and you're talking business, then yeah, it's a business dinner. Um, and you know you can definitely put that on your tax deductions as part of your expenses. You know, entrepreneurs, we eat out a lot. So yes, you're probably going to have quite a bit of, of uh, entertainment, of or those type of things on your credit, you know, I mean, on your t- uh, tax return records. But you just have to talk with your accounting professional to find out what they feel is best. Sometimes there can be little triggers, you know, if you have too much, like when I first started out in business, I had an accountant that was pretty conservative, so she didn't like take too much risk. Uh, so she would only, 
I might spend, uh, let's say, $3,000 that year eating out. But she would really only take about 2000 of that just because she didn't want to flag the IRS to make them look at me a little closer. So that's when your accounting professional can come in. But at the end of the day, you want to be legitimate. You don't want to take your family out to dinner and then call that a, a tax deduction, you know, and you know you didn't do any business. You know, your, your car, you know, are you leasing a car, buying a car? Are you using your car for business? If you're using a car for business then a portion, and you're using it also for personal, then a portion of that expense can be tax deductible. Um, your home, if you have a home office, based on, if you meet those standards as uh, set out by the IRS, then yes, a portion of your home, uh, home office expense can be tax deductible. So as long as you're using things for your business, it's definitely eligible. But once you sit down with your accounting professional, they'll really find out what you need. Do you have what you need to prove that you're actually using that for business? Because that's all it comes down to. For me, if, I, if you can't document what you're saying, then I have no leg to stand on if the IRS comes back and audits you. And so I'll advise you that, you know, that that's not a deduction you want to take unless we have the documentation to back it up. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants any part of that, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> so document, document, document. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And as far as like documenting those things, like where am I storing that? Do I put that in a flex file? How do I keep my receipts and all those things throughout the course of the year? Well, I like these new uh, receipt scanners. I think those are wonderful because paper, you know, fades, it gets soiled, do things get lost. So you have to figure out a system that works best for you. I always, I'm just old fashioned. I keep my hard receipts, but I also do my own bookkeeping. So I'm able to enter my data every month as I go along. And so I think a big part of the problem is going to be if you're not keeping records month to month, if you're only keeping all, if you're only entering all your data at the end of the year so that you're handing your file over to your accounting professional, or maybe you're not even doing that. Maybe you're just, like you said earlier, taking that shoebox and handed it to your accountant and saying, here, you figure it out. But I found out early on as an entrepreneur, that when I did that, that cost me a lot more money. <laughs> so I quickly uh, learned the importance of having my stuff in order from on a month to month basis by entering it into my financial software, whichever, you know, I had chosen to to do. So you don't want to go the whole year and wait to the end of the year to try to pull everything together because you're going to lose stuff. You are going to forget. You know, we think we're not going to forget, but you are going to forget. And I like to keep my receipts also. And I write a little note. Who did I go out to lunch with? What was it about? And that kind of helps me also. So if there's ever a question, I can put my hand on it and, and get the answer pretty quickly. But bookkeeping, I think, is a huge deal and I don't think enough of us are really taking that s seriously yeah you raise a good point there um, and I noticed you talked about just kind of keeping track of your accounts how often should I look at my money as an entrepreneur like how often should we be checking our balances looking at our budgets and then even beyond that the question after that would be how do we create a budget like and why it's important well, you need to check regularly. <laughs> and that's something that I did not do early on as an entrepreneur. You know, I really looked at my business finances as only being a tax issue, you know, handing it to my accountant and saying, OK, do I owe any money? That was my main question. But I did not monitor my finances to the point where I could make good business decisions, you know, Am I losing money in a certain area? You know, is maybe my merchant fees, are they too high? You know, I'm not recoup, I'm not able to recoup that. Or maybe I need to, you know, adjust my pricing. Am I charging enough? You got to know the drivers of your business. And so therefore you need a good financial system that allows you to see what's going on. And you should be checking that regularly. Yes, you need to, like you do your personal finances, balancing your check checking account, you need to balance your business account, you know, um, the same rules apply. Um, and it's, it's good to know and pull your financial uh, statements, you know, your balance sheet, your P&L statement, your cash flow statement, 
And if you don't know how to read those, which is a big issue for entrepreneurs, I know it was for me. I had no idea what any of those numbers meant. And that was a, a, a bad position to be in. But you need to take a class just to learn how to read financial statements so that when you have them sitting before you, you actually understand what you're, what you're looking at. Um, so that's where you're educa- becoming more educated in the area of finance is so important. Uh, you know, I, I learned so much by taking an accounting course. I mean, that was like probably the best investment I ever made because now I know when I look at things, I actually know what's happening. Before, I was completely oblivious, had no idea. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I completely get it. I'm not. I'm, I'm obviously not a math and numbers kind of person, so I totally understand. <laughs> yeah, I was totally oblivious. And I also make one another point about that is work, find a accounting professional that wants to partner with you. You know, I had an accountant, but she was not a partner. She was just doing what she needed to do to get my taxes filed. But when it came to helping me to really understand my business and how it worked and what my costs and my drivers were, she was not a, she was not a partner in that. And you really when you don't have a lot of knowledge about finance, you really need a partner that does. You know, um, I, I was listening to a, a talk and a young man said, you know, you partner um, based on your liabilities. What are you not good at? So if you're not good at money management finances, then you need to find a partner that is so that you can be strengthened in that area. So that's when you're looking for a accounting professional, that's what you really need to look for. I like that, you know, just the idea of having someone cover your back door. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk about budgeting real quick. That was the second part of my question. Yeah. How do I develop a budget for my business? How well, would, that's hmm? that's where you can go back to your uh, your business plan your business model hopefully you've built some kind of business model to, to see you know what your costs are uh, and your pricing and all of that um, and then you can kind of estimate after you do some research what it's going to cost you to run your business you know what are the what's the cost of you providing a service if you're writing then your time is your is the is the asset that you're spending uh, to be able to produce a piece of work. So how much is that? You know, what are the, what are the, the costs of that? Sitting down and saying, okay, marketing, what am I going to do for marketing? Okay. How much does it cost? Okay. I'm going to put an ad in the paper. Just, you know, say you might, you want, might want to do that. Okay. Well, how much is an ad going to cost? Oh, a thousand bucks. Well, we all know in marketing, you have to do something consistently before it actually pays off. So if you're going to do an ad a thousand dollars a month, then there you go. You have that line item. So coming up with your line items as to what you're anticipating you're going to spend is where you really need to start. And that comes into your, you know, your planning process. Now, let's talk about banking in terms of like, how do I choose or what criteria do you recommend for choosing a bank? I, I really go down to a relationship. You know, uh, what is their customer service? Because time is money, and if I have to fight through too many levels to get answers and get problems solved, uh, that's a problem for me. Um, and so uh, depending on what your needs are, if you're like me and you like to just get stuff done and you don't want to have to go through a whole lot of rigmarole, then maybe sometimes a smaller bank might be best. But with smaller banks, sometimes they're not able to offer a wide variety of services as compared to the larger banks. So um, it really depends on what your preferences are and what you uh, envision needing for your business maybe in the next 18 to 24 months. You know, if, if, if getting a loan, a SBA loan is important to you and that's part of your plan, then you need to be with a bank that has no problem funding those type of loans. If merchant services is something that, you know, credit card processing and you want a merchant account because you have a brick and mortar uh, business or what have you, then you know, then you need a bank that might be able to provide that service. So it really is going to depend on what what's valuable to you as far as services and the uh, customer service. 
I know when I opened my business account, one of the relationship bankers was like, hey, how about a line of credit? You know, so she, mm-hmm. wanted, she wanted to get me to get a credit card for my business. What are your thoughts on running businesses on credit cards? I think that's a very dangerous and slippery slope. I mean, I mean, there's plenty of stories that people have done it. So you cannot say that it's just totally, you know, totally wrong to do. But I would I would step cautiously uh, with the debt. Because sometimes we always are very optimistic as entrepreneurs are. We're very, you know, we have all this grandeur vision. But the reality is, is things don't always work out just exactly how we envision them. You might have an idea about your business starting off one way and it ends up morphing off into something different. And sometimes, you know, that can cause maybe revenues not to be what you anticipated. And now you have these credit card uh, liabilities looking at you. So I would just step cautiously and know what you're able to uh, handle should your business not be able to generate what you need in order to pay those debts and how much of your own personal uh, monies are you willing to put forth to help help carry your your, your business for, for a little while. My last question for you, just kind of aside from just the naming of the business, the structure, the taxes, the accounting, what other tips or guidelines do you offer for entrepreneurs listening to this episode? Yeah, you got to stay focused and you got to really, um, I'm, I'm a big stickler on the financing. I, I just, I don't understand how you can run a business and not know how much you're bringing in and how much is going out and, and more importantly, how it's going out. You know, what are you spending your money on? You know, are you buying swag? Are you buying, you know, are you spending money on pins and with your logo on it? Are you, you know, getting pencils and pads with your logo on it? And is that really giving you a return on an investment? You know, to me as entrepreneurs, we got to be lean. We got to be running lean machines um, and not, you know, when I first started out my business, uh, when I was in my 20s, I spent a lot of money on a lot of junk <laughs> and it did, it did not bring me any revenue at all. But I just thought that that was what you were supposed to do. I didn't have anybody to tell me different. Um, but the second go round, I, I learned that, you know, those things, they're nice and they're cute, but that's not necessarily where you need to invest your money. So look at things when you're spending money, look at it as a return on your investment. If I give this pin out, What's the likelihood that that person is going to call me and, you know, and do business with me that's going to generate some revenue? When you start to look at things from an investment perspective, it really helps you to make some changes in your decision making. I'm glad you brought up return on investment because that's a really important thing. Uh, A few years ago, I had to buy a new computer. And part of my kind of calculation to buying this computer was I to figure out how many jobs it was going to take me to recoup that money. Yes. <laughs> you know? Exactly. <laughs> and most people don't think of it that way. They just say, I need a computer, so I, I have to get one. But what are you going to do to generate that revenue? You're right, to cover that computer. You're exactly right. So. Yeah, it's just one of those lessons that you learn as you go through business. That uh, Everything has a price, and at some point you have to, for everything that you put out or everything, every service that you buy or, you know, like you said, the swag, you have to figure out, okay, what is the cost? What is the cost to me? Because yeah, I'm paying physical cash, but I've got to return service to get that money back. That's right. So I've got to either, right. either I got to sell X amount of books. I've got to sell X amount of stories. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's it's really important to to watch your money. I mean, it get it, and because it, it gets away from you so fast, <laughs> and most of the times we we don't have good personal finance habits and what people don't realize is those habits actually transfer over to your business. So the way you manage your household finances, that's more than likely how you're managing your business finances. So if you're struggling on the personal end, you're probably going to end up struggling on the on the fi- on the business end as well. I mean, I've coached people and they they repeated habits and patterns um, in both areas. So it's it's something that you definitely need to, to catch early and, and get a handle on. Well, I'm glad you talked about that the, the financial side so much. Um, I was listening to a podcast episode where Damon John said that that was, for him for a while, that was one of the biggest stumbling blocks. But once he figured out that, he said he couldn't believe that he went so long without financial literacy in his business. Yes, yes. It's amazing. I'm telling you, when I took that, when I got my degree in accounting, it was like my, my eyes opened up. It's like, that was like, wow, 
look at what I was missing and, and all the poor decisions I made just because I lacked the information. I lacked that knowledge. All right. Yep. So, all right, guys listening, go take a financial class, yeah. get a book on finance, really uh, become a student of finance because it's what's going to really jumpstart your business. Definitely. Definitely. Janae, do you have any closing wisdom that you want to share? Yes. Let's see. Mentorship. I think it's important to have mentors. Find someone that you can trust, that has achieved what you wanted to, that you desire to achieve. And and, and, and allow them to pour into your life. I think it's so important to not try to go it alone. You know, just because you're a solopreneur doesn't mean you're alone. You may not have a staff. You may not have a, a, a big group of people that you can call on. But you got to at least have one or two key people that can strengthen you in those areas that you're weak. Awesome. Well, th- hey, thank you so much for joining me today and talking startups. Thank you for having me. And best wishes on all your endeavors. Thanks so much. Wow, what an inspiring episode. If you weren't able to take notes, I've got you covered. Visit my website at www.chrisjonesinc.com forward slash podcast to get today's show notes as well as access other episodes you may have missed. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast on iTunes. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time.